Hi there. Um, my name is Ivan Glynn. I'm the director of the SMB here in Wales. And welcome to you all to a short Q&A uh, session that we're about to conduct uh, with one of our members up in North Wales. Um, Gareth Jones um, is here to talk to us today about the role of renewable energy in cutting carbon emissions from homes. Uh, Gareth runs a company called Carbon Zero Renewables. Uh, they're based in North Wales and work um, predominantly across North Wales and the northwest of England installing renewable solutions uh, in people's homes. Gareth was re recently appointed ambassador for the Net Zero North Wales Network and also has a key, uh, keen interest in the wider construction sector and is in fact uh, the vice president of the FMB Cymru Board. Welcome Gareth, how are you doing? How are you doing? UK, nice to see you again Ivan. Good, good. Okay, should we go straight into the questions? Yeah, absolutely. Excellent, okay. So, can you introduce yourself and tell us a bit about your business and how the business got to where it is today? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, Gareth Jones, I'm the Managing Director of Carbon Zero Renewables, which is part of the Carbon Zero Group. Uh, we're based up in, up in North Wales, and as you say, we cover North Wales, the Northwest, a little bit into South Wales um, on occasion. Um, and, yeah, we, we've been in this for nearly 15 years now so we've, we've uh, my background is civils construction and I got into this industry sort of around two and yeah it's been a journey it's been a very interesting journey a lot's changed it's happened um and it's certainly been a, a bit of a we call it the solar coaster it's a, it's a very turbulent industry it's a nice one to be in but it's quite turbulent um but it's nice to see today um being here We've got. We feel like we've got more stability within the sector because there's no grants anymore. There are some, you know, some from some some eco funding that some of you may have come across. That's that's different to where I operate. Um, but we we work in what we call the able to pay sector, where people would would pay for the work to be done, and um, so that that's where we work and we have always worked in that sector. Um, but yes, yeah, so the, the key component for us really is, is is quality. And obviously that matches in with the Federation of Master Builders and why I got involved. My passion is installing quality, um, fitting it right first time is is such an important thing when it comes to, I believe, in, in the renewable energy sector. A lot of these components are fitted to last a very, very long time. So it's, you know, it's important that you, you, you're installing a quality product for people. Um, so yeah, that, that's a bit about me. Um, we've like I said, been doing it for a very long time now, and um, it's 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 an ever changing landscape at the moment. So it's it's quite an exciting sector. Okay, and how are you seeing the sector currently? Then you know, presumably there's been a massive spike in demand since the sharp increases in energy costs. Is that what you're seeing? Yeah, certainly. So about September, um, you know, last year, it's where it really started to take. Uh, so the year before. Um, it's really started taking off. Um, and that was around uh, the COP uh, meeting they had up in Scotland and, and it just went bananas. And obviously we've got the Ukraine war. Um, we were just seeing huge pressures on not just domestic, but, but obviously on businesses as well. And, you know, you, you see it in the newspapers and the media all the time, the amount of businesses and pubs closing, restaurants closing. And, um, you know, and a lot of this is business pressures due to energy prices. And, and it, it's got to the point where, people you, you can't sit around and do nothing because of the pressures and and so we're finding a lot of domestic homes and a lot of businesses are looking at solutions to become viable again because it's it, you know energy is just rocketed and, and consumers have got some level of protection and but businesses not really so businesses are really wide open to some of these huge increases and uh, and it's making a lot of businesses unviable and that, that's the concern Mm, okay. Um, can you tell us a bit more about kind of, you know, what some of these kind of renewable solutions are? Because, um, you know, people will have an idea of what renewable energy is, you know, they'll think of solar, etc. But can you tell us a bit more about, you know, what is, what are these renewable energy um, solutions? What are they? Yeah, there's, there's a number of key technologies that have been around for, for many, many years. So you've got solar PV, um, which stands for photovoltaics. That's mainly that's that's what we specialize in today. So that's that's obviously generating electricity through solar panels. Um, you've got solar hot water solutions, um, which again is using the, the, the sun 
um, with, with, a, with a panel on, on the roof generally that provides free hot water. You've got biomass boilers, which is burning of either wood or pellets to create heat uh, for your home. You've got air source heat pumps, which a lot of people probably come across now. Air source is like a, a reverse air conditioning system um, to provide heating hot water uh, for people's homes. Obviously, there's, a, there's quite a big mass adoption of heat pumps. Uh, I've been quite vocal about my opinions on heat pumps, and maybe that's another another podcast. But um, you know, they, they do have a have a, have a place, um, but the, you know that's another story so that you've got you've got heat uh, air source heat pumps ground source heat pumps so again similar concept but again because the temperature in the ground is actually quite a constant temperature you can actually um quite efficiently convert that temperature into into heat for the home the downside with heat pumps is they generate temperatures at lower levels so that's something that has caught some people out in the past or someone who's inexperienced with dealing with heat pumps because they are low temperatures. So they work lovely with the underfloor heating systems. But again, you've just got to be careful if you're retrofitting, because a lot of the air, the heat pump air source market is retrofit. And you've got to look at radiators might be too small. So sometimes you need to put a bigger radiator in because the temperature is lower. So there's a few things to consider when looking at heat pumps and things. So it's, it's important you're taking the right advice and things. Obviously, we've got wind turbines. We don't really look at wind turbines in the small domestic market because they're very, very expensive. They do work. There's a lot of challenges around wind turbines, planning constraints, maintenance. Um, historically, they've been very, very expensive. Um, so wind is not really something we'd look at on a small scale on the, on the, from a domestic point of view. Um, it is viable for some farmers, etc. But again, you've got quite a lot of planning constraints and challenges and then there's some other sort of products um in the renewables market that that work in not necessarily renewable technology but there's there's some more little gizmos and you know we like for example we used to fit a lot of hot solar hot water systems many years ago and then around 2012 13 14 15 somewhere around that time um a few a few uh, mm. boxes that were um we call them um solar switches and what they do is send spare power back to your hot water system. Um, and so any so any spare electricity coming from your solar PV panels, it just diverts it to your, to your immersion and it heats your hot water for free. Those are about five, six hundred pounds, maybe upwards of a thousand pounds installed, depending on the complexity. Um, but that's a lot cheaper than four to five thousand pounds for a solar thermal system. So we we sort of stopped them and, and went and moved towards those switches now, which are you know, there's also some other technologies that probably aren't as well known of, but arguably not renew, renewable sourced. But uh, infrared heating um, is another is another technology to, to look at. We we went on a recent visit, didn't we, Ivan, at the um, Sustainable Energy Centre. We did. And it was um, they were looking at the latest technology in infrared. Um, mats that, that can go in, in into walls and the fabric. Uh, I've been involved in infrared heating for over 10 years, but the stuff we've been fitting has been panels that fit on the wall and ceilings, and they work incredibly well. Again, as long as they're sized right and fitted correctly, they, they do work. Um, but yeah, infrared heating is one to watch. That's I, I, I've got you know big belief. It's we've been we've been looking at it, like I said and storing it for over 10 years, but again, it's just it's not as mainstream as heat pumps and some of these other technologies. Okay. So what are you saying, just in terms of kind of the, you know, the tech that is out there, um, the category of choices that, um, you know, installers, builders, consumers have, presumably um, the solutions for house A will be quite varied to house B. It'll, it'll kind of depend on, you know, the, microclimate of that area the fabric of that house etc um am i am i right in saying that it's quite it's quite varied. yeah it's i think every house unless you're in a new build situation and all the houses are the same then that, then that's a different conversation because you know in that situation one size sort of does fit all because they're all the same houses arguably um but when we're looking at retrofit projects um 
again, it's, 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 a, it's a case of understanding what the consumer wants to do as well. What's the, what do they actually want to do? And I've always been a massive believer um, that, you know, P, solar PV is, 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 is a must because you can't, you know, it's only, it's only up until recently that with the Ukraine war, that mains gas has gone more expensive. Mains gas has been incredibly cheap for the last 20 years compared to other parts of Europe. And, but you can't generate your own electric. Um, you can't generate your own gas at home, but you can generate your own electric. So electric's always been the, the number one thing. If you look at a heat pump or whatever it is you want to heat your home with, they all require electric. So the, the, the first port of call is, is making sure you've got the right suitably sized solar PV system to suit your property based on your, your needs and wants. Obviously, there's a massive drive towards electric cars. It's electric. So there's the, the common fact here is electric. We're always going to need electric. So solar PV is a bit of a no-brainer um, because everything needs electric. Um, and then we start looking at heat sources and things like that because um it again i think it depends on the the level of renovation or retrofit work that's going into that property because if a customer is not planning to redo a complete new heating system then an infrared heating system might be again powered off the electric from the, from the pv panels if they're looking at more in, more invasive reno, renovation works and yeah, they may want to look at a heat pump. That you know, there are some grants towards things like that at the moment, um, and that might be a consideration for people. But I think it's just getting, it's just getting that sort of open and honest advice, really. But but solar PV definitely is a pretty much a no brainer for anyone. Um, but from different heating sources, it's it's a case of just understanding. You know, if you go to a heat pump company, they're going to tell you heat pumps are the best things since sliced bread. If you go to a biomass company, they're going to tell you biomass company. You know. So it is difficult trying to get that independent advice. And, you know, I'd always urge a consumer to do their own research and to look into what is the best solution for them. Mm -hmm. uh, from experience, biomass boilers suit a certain type of person. You know, there's a little bit more to biomass. You have to manually fill it up with pellets. You can get automatic feeders and all this, but there's still some human interaction required to, to sort these things out. But with a heat pump, it's a little bit more user-friendly. You you know you turn the heating on and it and the heat pump works type situation uh, with much user requirements. Um, so definitely you know consumers need to do their own bit of research. Um, but we're finding a huge volume of people at the moment are looking at battery storage as well. Again, not a renewable technology as such, but it's it, we're finding probably eighty five percent of our customers are having a battery to support their solar system. So they've they've got free power to, to use during the night um so that we're finding is becoming a very very uh, popular product buy as well okay um th well I, I was going to come so, on yeah. to that yeah if you could kind of um you know elaborate on on that we've covered kind of how we you know the different ways of creating energy um if you can now tell us a bit more about kind of how that energy is stored you know you mentioned battery and like you know what, what are some of the developments that we've seen in renewable energy storing over years, you know, over recent years, and kind of, um, what do you think is, you know, is to come um, on that front as well? Yeah, I think we, you know, I think people were expecting um, batteries to come down in price, and we we haven't really seen battery prices coming down. Um, if anything, we've seen some prices go up. Tesla batteries have gone up, you know, four times in the last twelve months. But again, I think that a lot of this is down to global pressures. Um, I think there are some new tech coming out with regard. There's, there's some different ways of storing power. You know, there's some there's some batteries that you know you can get like they store hot water rather than storing storing you know is in is in an electric p you know. Um, but we we install three types of batteries. Um, you know, very in different prices but we with with ourselves and our business model isn't we're we're very much around quality stuff um so we we have a german brand with tesla and we've got we've got um a solar edge system which is the, the biggest in the world um there's an awful lot of batteries coming from the far east and again i would just urge consumers to do their research because a lot of these battery companies are offering 10-year warranties but they've only been in business two years so just be very careful about what you are buying 
Um, personally, as, as, a, as a business owner and the ethics we have in line with the Federation of Master Builders, I won't fit them because I don't have the confidence in them because there's no longevity and no history around them. You know, the battery market is, is pretty new. So if you're going to purchase something, you need to be purchasing it with a, a manufacturer that's that's got some credibility in that sector. So hence Tesla being one of the biggest companies in the world. We deal with a company called Sonnen, which are a German brand, which I believe have just been bought by Shell. And like I said, Solar Edge are the biggest inverter manufacturer in the world. And obviously have the, the new battery system. So we, we very much worked that way, but not all solar installers have gone that route and um i'm not saying the other products in the market aren't good it's just making sure the consumers just need to be aware of the warranty isn't with the installer the warranty is with the manufacturer and one of the downsides we've had with the solar industry is very very credible companies manufacturers going out of business so back in 2016 um there was a manufacturer called solar world for example at the time, they were the biggest solar panel manufacturer in the world. They were a German company, fantastic quality, and they got involved in a huge argument um, with regards to import of Chinese panels, and, and it cost them a fortune, and they actually went out of business. And um, we've, we've seen it quite a few occasions that manufacturers in this sector can go out of business. And in the end, what that leaves to consumers with, consumers with no warranty and you know it's all having 20 25 year warranties on products because um solar panels actually have two warranties they have a product warranty and they have a performance warranty so the product warranty is if obviously it stops working or the frame falls apart or something and you'd get a replacement panel and i'll go on to that in a second and then you have a performance warranty that it has to be efficiently performing a certain way over the lifespan of that product um so the very very long warranty so again it's making sure that whoever you whoever solar panels you've got on your roof that actually that that's a credible company you know how can they you know are they going to be around in 25 years or 20 years to service your warranty because another factor within the, within the industry which is a bit of a sort of in an industry issue issue globally is if i have a customer from 10 years ago whose, whose panel fails Unless I've got one in my warehouse, it's probably unlikely we'll get a like for like match because the now different the now different sizes, um, the, the materials are different. The you just you know that particular manufacturer may no longer be trading. There's so many different pressures. So we've seen a rise in people who've got an insurance claim because maybe Ooh. they might have storm damage on one panel. We're actually you're having to replace all the panels because you can't get one, or you have to re, you know reduce the system size down. Um, so there's quite a lot of factors involved in in future operations and maintenance around um, solar. And that's probably another conversation again. But it's a, it's it, it goes back to consumers buying with confidence the manufacturer that that of the panels they're getting on the roof because you know you don't want to be in a position where you can't get a product. Um, because some of these manufacturers looking at some reading some of the warranties, if they if they can't give you a light flight panel, they'll give you credit against another one, mm. or they'll ask you to send back the old panel to China, which is going to cost you a fortune, and then then it'll be like, oh, sorry, we we can't fix it, so we'll send you a credit. You yeah. know, it, it's just but 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 all that time your system's not working because you've got a panel missing, you know, or you think, and plus the warranties don't always cover the cost of having to put a scaffold up and the installer company to take take it off and, and put it back on. The consumer co covers that cost. So it is really important that consumers look at what they're actually buying. And that's something we we find a lot is people don't actually know what they're buying. Um, and we're also finding a lot of customers don't even check what, they're having installed we've 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 heard some horror stories in the past where someone's thought they're buying this top spec panel where actually they've had some cheap chinese thing fitted they didn't look at the label the, the panels turned up on the on the driveway the guys cracked on fitting them the customer's not going to go up on the roof and, and lift the panels and check so mm. again credibility in, in the installer making sure 
but you're actually getting what you paid for. On that then, Gareth, you, you mentioned, you know, kind of, um, it seems that there's quite the responsibility on the consumer in terms of kind of ensuring that um, the product is right, the warranty in place is, uh, is right, and this is, that it's kind of installed by a credible um, company. Um, but apart from kind of doing research, you know, can you tell us a bit more about kind of what type of regulations are around this sector? You know, I, I saw you quoted in the press recently around, um, you, you were quoted as saying, you know, that, uh, that there has been a kind of massive influx in companies popping up out of nowhere into this area and then disappearing again. And obviously, if you, you know, if your solar panels fail, then you've got nowhere to turn. But also, people, consumers buying offline and installing it themselves. Yeah. Um, so, what kind of, you know, are there any accreditations or anything that consumers um, slash builders looking to subcontract should be looking for in this area? Yeah. So, the, the, the main thing is, is being MCS accredited. So, you, have, you need to ensure the installer is MCS accredited. Um, to get MCS accreditation, you also need to be uh, to have Renewable Energy Code of Conduct as well, the RECC. So that's a, similar to the FMB, the RECC sort of governs this sort of sector. Um, those are the two, the two main ones. Um, from a training point of view, obviously, there's manufacturer-specific training. Um, you know, there's a, there's a bit of an overlap between roofing and electrical trades. Um you know, but those are the key ones. It's been making making sure the installer's MCS accredited is 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 the very is the, is the minimum. Um, you can get MCS accreditation through NAPIT. You can get it through NICIC. There's there's quite a number of different places you can get the MCS accreditation. Um, but that's that's the most important thing consumers need to make sure. Also, as part of the accreditation, whenever you sell a domestic solar system, you have to give it an insurance back guarantee. And these things get missold all the time. The amount of times I've heard, oh, I've got a 10 year warranty. You haven't. You've only got you've got 10 year insurance back guarantee if that company goes out of business. It only kicks in if that company goes out of business. And I hear it all the time. You get you get we hear I've heard, heard it for years, salespeople just 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 you know, selling it the wrong way. Um, it's got a 10 year warranty. You know, if anything goes wrong, we're already 10 years and it's you know. I don't get, you know, we've been in the game over 10 years and we don't give 10 year, you know, um, installer warranties because a lot can happen in 10 years. Um, under MCS, we have to give our consumers a two year warranty. So it's, it's, it's very different to the construction sector where there are warranties, but we have to give people a two year installation warranty. So if anything goes wrong with the installation within two years, a leaky roof or a product fails or whatever, we have we're liable to, to fix it with no no you know no labor costs um unless it's storm damage or something you know something that's 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 outside the the normal parameters but if it's a general repair um it's it's a two year warranty commercial is usually a 12 month warranty um okay. so yeah it's really important you get all those 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 things off of off your installer Okay, um, so I'm about to ask you a big question now, so get ready for it. So, um, <laughs> testing carbon, testing carbon emit, em, emitted from homes is clearly not happen, happening at the pace and scale required if we are to meet our net zero obligations. Why do you think this is, and what needs to happen for this to change? That is a big question. Um, I think there's, awful, there's an awful lot of red tape involved in a lot of things, but I think... Um, some of the, I think some of the vehicles that, when I say vehicles, the the, the way the government has like eco funding, for example, is, you know, it's there for a purpose and it's there to help people in fuel poverty. I don't think it's any longer really fit for purpose in what it, it does. I don't. It could the whole thing could have been accelerated a lot quicker. I think the way the governments historically have dealt with the whole industry has delayed it. You know, we've we've literally, like I said, we call it the solar coaster because it's up and down. It, it depends on what flavor of the month it is, which which prime minister's in. It's one minute they like it, one minute they don't. You know, we the Labour government brought the freedom tariffs in. Conservatives came in. David Cameron and his team they obviously started cutting the feeding tariffs because it was incredibly too generous. But it but it created it created the start of the industry. 
uh, and arguably it needed that those generous tariffs to actually kickstart the industry to start with. But um, I think the industry is just the whole sector's just been messed about with so much, and it and it and it just it affects consumer confidence in buying and what's going on. And oh, there used to be tariffs. There's not anymore. I'm not going to get them anymore because there's no point because there's no tariff anymore. But, you know, so there's a lot of misconceptions which put people off. Um, mm. So I think I just think a lot of that has caused the rollout of renewables to be a lot slower than it could have been. We find mm. a lot more benefit comes from word of mouth, which we all know has been as business owners. Word of mouth is, is one of the best forms of marketing. But we also get so much from a word of mouth and referrals from our customers just by doing a great job and doing what we say we're going to do the amount of customers refer us on to friends and family because, you know, they start seeing the benefits and go, wow, this, this does actually really work, you know, uh, and yeah, you need to get this. It's great. It's saving me loads. Of money. You know, is that adoption over the, the, you know, other people telling you or an advertisement in a magazine, that sort of thing. Um, but I, th I think the eco funding is, is problematic. It's, it's free. There's always an issue when it's free. Everyone thinks what's the catch is it's free, um, but it is there to help people in fuel poverty. And I just think that could have been dealt with better and the industry could have been a little bit cleaner with the type of people who are involved in that sector. I think there's, um, um, there's some unscrupulous characters in that sector who are making a lot of money out of these um, funding schemes that are there to help people. Um, mm. And uh, I've seen it from my own eyes. Um, you know, and, and that's probably again another, another conversation. But um, it's it's. I think I think we've got a solid plan going forward now. I think the fact that the government and we've got the green agenda, the net zero agenda. I think there's a lot more emphasis behind the government actually want to make these changes, and I think that is we are starting to feel that the consumers are, are taking that on board, and actually with things like the war in ukraine and all this this energy crisis we we're going through you know it's starting to make people realize actually i need to do something now i need to protect myself i need to look at how if this ever happened again that i'm not you know so exposed and i i can you know so if whether it's a case of buying a new car or putting a conservatory on but actually i'm going to future instead of using that for that i'm going to use that money to future proof my, my home, which I'm gonna, I don't want to move from with these technologies, but I know that I'm gonna, my energy prices, my my home energy running costs are gonna be a lot lower than I think gives people peace of mind knowing that. And I think we'll see consumers make those changes over the next couple of years because the war in Ukraine and the energy crisis is making people change, you know, think a different way than they have historically. So I think we'll naturally see. Uh, you know the pace increase now um but i think some of the technologies i think that have been pushed and i think you know um heat pumps there's obviously a huge heat pump agenda don't think it's the ultimate solution i i, I personally believe we should have had a, a more emphasis rollout on solar pv mm -hmm. quick it's very simple to install it works as soon as it's fitted and commissioned where and you get into results and then look at a heat pump after instead of fitting a heat pump your electricity bills are now going to go up okay your gas might come that is going to come down but your electricity mm. cost has gone through the roof well you could have had solar panels first to offset the, the the heat pump so i just i just think the government have done that maybe the wrong way around it should have gone for pv because it's much quicker to fit a pv system we can do it in a day you know a heat pump could be three four five days work depending on the complexity so I think the rollout could have been a lot quicker if we'd gone for the solar PV angle to start with. Mm. Personally. OK, um, so do you buy into the concept of fabric first? Um, I, you know, this idea that installing new renewable energy into your into your property is pointless unless the fabric of the house is up to scratch so that, you know, um, the focus in the first instance should be on improving the fabric of the house before you do, any, do anything else. Do you agree with that um, concept? I think if you'd asked me that question five years ago, I would have said fabric first. I mean, it, 
and this is going to be quite a topical sort of conversation, topical question to answer, I think, because I think a lot of people will have their own opinions on this. And, and it's not that I don't agree with Fabric First, because in print, Fabric First is where it should be. We need to get, we need to stop all the leaks, stop all the, you know, capitulation, right? Then look at uh, renewable technology. Um, but the, the, the fact it takes so long to get some of these measures done and somebody, you know, external wall insulation is ferociously expensive. So if, you, if you're going to re renovate your house and you've got a budget, you know, external wall insulation is very, very expensive unless you're in a position, a situation where you actually are looking at um, maybe rendering the house or changing the appearance, and, but then you've already got a budget maybe for that. Um, I personally believe today with energy price we are and you know with war on ukraine and, and all the global pressures we should be looking at renewable technologies to start with because once they're installed they work straight away and then you can the, and then the more you, and then if you change the fabric of the building then obviously you'll get more efficient again but certainly from a solar pv point of view again what, what we just mentioned before by having solar fitted straight away you're saving straight away um and, and this and this goes into the sort of government realms as well and, and again into the eco schemes and, and Obed, which we've had in wales is solar pv is very quick it's very simple it makes savings straight away hundreds of pounds a year com compared to have an external wall in trying to retrofit external wall insulation to tens of thousands of homes or hundreds of thousands of homes you're talking across the uk it's going to take years and years. I mean, we were involved in the external wall insulation probably about 10 years ago. And the numbers being banded around then, it was going to, you know, the number of homes they needed to retrofit was going to take 20 to 30 years to try and get anywhere near. And that's if you had an army of people actually retrofitting homes. It's just not going to happen. It just it just won't happen. But in that time, you know, in that time scale and the money involved, you could fix some of the renewables like solar PV, for example, which are just installed quickly and have an impact on people's homes and lives and, 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 and instantly reduce people's power. Um, there's just, I just, there's sometimes we just need to, what was right many years ago and some of them quite, you know, it, things always need reviewing. And I think um, by energy today, by making conscious decisions like that, you can say, I'm not in, I'm not in, five years time um so that, that's i think i think times are changing just to answer your question you know fabric fabric is important but actually if you can generate your own you know if you can save 70 percent on your electricity bills yeah then that's good and that's and, and you can do that within a few a few weeks time or a few months mm -hmm. rather than having to have external wall insulation which is major, major work really mm -hmm. um that's 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 going to save you probably less and probably take you maybe twenty years to pay you back. You know, solar solar PV becomes very very appealing to people. So yeah, and it's the same with heat pumps and other technologies. In the end, I just think we need to look at stuff that's going to impact us now and not you know not in the future. But I do still think fabric is important. I, I don't want people to come to listen into this and think fabric isn't important. It is important. Mm. Because obviously it's we're, we're losing heat, we're losing power, and whatever you want to call it, and which in, which is ultimately contributing to the carbon footprint. But I just think if people want instant sort of, I need to save bills now. There's other ways of doing it than, than looking at the fabric. Yeah. Okay. So in a nutshell, a fabric first is a nice to have rather than a must have at the moment. Yeah. I would say so right this second yeah i would yeah. say so it, it is important don't get me wrong it is a stress it is important mm. and i suppose if your property is extremely leaky then you probably do need to but if you know if you live in a in a you know a 90s you know home that's 20 25 years old it's not horrendously horrendously built yeah um you might want to look at some of the technologies before looking at you know retrofit external wall insulation or something like that yeah okay um so moving on any tips to members who would like to start offering renewable energy solutions to their clients as a you know in-house so to speak 
Okay, I think so. It depends on the on the the type of um, member they are. You know, if, if they're production or if they're a, you know a, or of a plumbing and heating company. Because I know even though with the FMB, there's obviously a mix of trades in there. Um, mm -hmm. So it's looking at your current skill set. If if you are maybe a construction company and you're looking to bring people into the business, to for example, you're looking to bring in a plumber or a, a heating engineer to do heat pumps, for example, then obviously the first thing is making sure whoever you're bringing in has got the required skill sets or the staff you have existing have the skill sets or the basic understanding of the skill sets um most manufacturers of products will tend especially in the sort of plumbing and heating sector will have manufacturer specific training and obviously we went to the um stable energy center they do training and there's there's, there's other centers you know in other places where they do similar things and um so you know, my, my advice would be to obviously make sure the manufacturers you're looking at are obviously have got solid warranties and they're going to look after you because there's nothing worse. You go install at a heat pumps. The next thing, you know, you can't get hold of the company. You haven't got that support. You've got customers with no heating. You'll get, you'll get the phone calls and the headaches, but you've got no technical support. So that's really important to make sure you've got that support behind you to, to allow you to give that service. And that's something that's quite important to think about because if, if your solar PV panels stop working, you've still got power from the grid. If your heat pump goes down, the home the, heat, the, the homeowner's got no heating and hot water. So it's a very different phone call and it's usually a more, you know, quicker response time that you're going to have to give as a company to go and sort that issue out. So, um, so skills, look at your existing skills in your business. Um, if you're having to bring people in, make sure they've got the skills. So speak to find, you know, do some research, find out what manufacturers and things you want to deal with, what type of, you know, and, and again, support wise and on warranties, that sort of thing. Um, then, and then we need to look at, um, the other aspect is how we can, um, look at uh, installing and stuff like that. So again, it's skills. So when it comes to say, for example, solar PV, we need to look at, you know, you know, if you've got roofers on, on in, you know, in-house, are they going to be subcontracting? If you're looking at MCS and things, there are some guidance rules around having subcontractors and things in your business and making sure they follow the rules and ethics of, of MCS and want as well. What you don't want is a roofing company coming in who, who don't really, quite understand what they're doing and um and cause you a load of problems as well because again you're the one who's got your name on the line because you're the one delivering the installation um so again from a roofing point of view there are i know napit do some roofing courses the problem is with some of these courses there's only so much you're going to learn in one day you know a lot of this unfortunately is is practical experience getting out there and doing it um it was it was very difficult, I think, when when to actually get in to get an MCS accreditation, you have to install a job. So it's a, a bit of a chicken and egg. So what you what you tend to find is the owner of the company will generally put solar panels on his own house and he'll use that as a test bed to get his MCS accreditation. Otherwise, you have to almost lie to a customer um, that you because if you're a consumer. You're not really going to employ a company. You don't want to employ a company who's not MCS accredited. So, but you can't get your MCS accredited until you've installed one. So you have, so we have found that co companies have had to lie to the co consumer, tell them they are, fit it, then get an accreditation on that installation. Um, mm. That's why you tend to find the the business owner will put it on his own home first, get the accreditation that way, and then they can ethically go in. You know sell it to people that the fact they have got MCS. But obviously yeah. by the business owner maybe doing his own home, you know, if you, you know, if you've got a bit more of a controlled environment for training and that sort of thing, or if you've got someone within the business who wants it fitting and again something can be done that way, then um but yeah, it's just it's a bit of a chicken and egg thing. You can't sell MCS. You can't sell soul without MCS, but you can't get MCS until you're fitted one. So um, okay. so that's something to think about how you manage that. But like I said, most most companies will probably fit it on their own home first, okay. or a family net or something like that. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so last question: um, 
any insight into new tech on the horizon that you find particularly exciting. So you probably don't get all that excited about, you know, even though this is your field, you, you've been in it for so long. Whereas I, on the other hand, I'm excited by a lot of it. So you know, I'm just wowed by most of it. So like, you know, when we went to the sustainability energy center, just something as simple as insulation paint was, you know, like, wow. For you probably, you know, you, you had a different view, but um, yeah, any kind of tax uh, renewable energy focused technology that is out there that's, you know, kind of um, on the cusp of coming into the market or that is being developed that you heard of that you think, wow, that's, that's exciting. Yeah, I think, um, I, I mentioned before infrared heating, infrared's been around a long time, but it's only very recently it's becoming mainstream and it's becoming, it's becoming noticed by um, social housing groups and, and other organizations that actually um, we actually did a job back in 2016. We did a job um, for, I think it was for Cardiff Council, and they, they built a home in the future. Um, and we actually fitted it with, with infrared heating back then. So um, it's it just, I know it's been around for a long time. It's I still feel it. it's almost a new technology because a lot of people never heard of it. They don't know what it does. You know, it, it doesn't, it's not traditional heating and it's also a very different type of heat so a lot of people are used to you know off a radiator hot air rises and it and it cools and it and it's that cooled air that's that what sort of heats the room um you know we're, we're used to that with infrared heating it's it's an infrared ray um it's actually a form of radiation but we we avoid we avoid the r word because it scares people but it's 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 the mm. say you know the sun's rays are radiation and but it's it's a very safe form of infrared. It's absorbed naturally by the body. It's it's a very very safe form of low energy heating. Um, I think infrared is is is, is definitely one to watch, um, even though it's been around a long time because it just feels like it's starting to get some traction. Some talking to people in the industry, there's a lot more people talking about it, and and there's a lot of social housing schemes starting to looking at adopting this. And then you've got the the fact that now you can, you know, you can put the core basics of it into plaster, into plaster, in, into walls and ceilings. Um, so I think that certainly one to, to keep an eye on for. And, in the, and the, from an installer point of view, it's actually very easy to install. It's um, it's, it's not a job, but it's it's it's, it's very simple. Um, you know, it's all wireless operated. You know, it's all very low energy. Um, it's quite non-invasive in some respects. So it's. It, yeah, it's a very simple installation. Um, so I think that's certainly one to watch. Um, and I think batteries are going to get better. I think we're going to see some better battery technology. And it, and it was good to see some some other little small energy savings, you know, um, like the wastewater heat recovery we saw at the Stainable Energy Centre was quite a nice little system. Again, maybe not amazing if you have from a retrofit, unless you're doing, a, you know, quite a big renovation project. But there's, there's quite a few little, little ways. But on the... Re- on the renewable heat on the renewable energy side there's not a massive a massive amount of things what you're tending to find is some of the existing players in the market are just constantly improving the tech solar mm-hmm. panels are getting higher wattages but what we're finding is the panels are becoming bigger so they're, get, they're getting a little bit more efficient but they're not massively getting massively efficient if that makes sense so yeah. you're finding that wattages are going bigger but they are the panels are getting bigger as well um but certainly, there, there, you know, I think some of the tech involved in that is probably getting a little bit exciting. Uh, and I think safety, I think we haven't touched on safety today, but there was, a, there was an article uh, that I did um, a few weeks back at the same, um, you know, with regards to cowboys in the industry. And, and obviously there was a freedom of, freedom of information request. And there was the, currently the in the UK, there's 10 solar fires a month, which is quite a staggering number, I think. Um, and it just and again safety sh- you know should be a major factor in people's decisions for any anything you know renewable energy um, but certainly solar panels you know safety is a big thing um, so yeah that's something to keep an eye on okay brilliant well you know it's a very exciting industry that y- you're working in and it's you know it's kind of um, it's something that's been around for a long time, you know, as you mentioned, but um, 
is is really starting to take off now with the um with the energy crisis that we are seeing and um uh you know the perhaps a kind of silver lining in a way of um the energy crisis that we are experiencing is that it has uh forced people to kind of um look at incorporating some of these tests but Gareth, thank you so much for uh, for your time today. Um, no it's been it's been very informative, and there are lots so we you know of other things that we could have covered. So maybe we can do it again sometime. But yeah, thanks for your time. Definitely. Thanks, thanks, everyone.